What's your name? Uh, my full name is Myron Daniel Steinman. Mm -hmm. And how old are you, Myron? I'm 59 next April. And how long have you been a member of the Disability and Human Rights Group? Uh, I have to do the math. I'm not so good at math sometimes. Yeah, what, what year did you become a member? Um, I believe it was before 2011. Before 2011? Oh, right on. And what is your current job? My current paid employment is with Thresholds Homeless and Support. Oh, right on. Very cool. Okay, and what's your favorite thing about being a member of the Disability and Human Rights Group? Uh, my favorite thing is the face-to-face -face contact with people. And what is it you get out of that with the other members? You, we get to know each other. We get, we get to put a name to a face. And do you find a lot of support from the other members? Uh, the membership uh, varies, but uh, yes, there is a lot of support from each other. And uh, in particular, one fellow I do meet outside the group very often. Most of the other people I don't meet outside of the group, so, uh, so it varies with individuals. And what do you think the importance is of lived experience in advocacy and in your group? Well, Lived experience, advocacy, in my mind, is often understood as something you do for someone else. And with lived experience, uh, our goal is to try to advocate for ourselves. And that does not mean that we do not also advocate for other people. So I'm talking about two sides of my mouth there. Come on. Very cool. Um, why do you think it is that lived experience doesn't play a role when people make decisions that affect someone like you? Well, for many people in the group, uh, for persons like myself, The group that we are talking about is the Disability and Human Rights Group, and uh, I have a disability. Uh, I have several disabilities. Uh, they may be hidden in this interview. Uh, could you repeat the question? Yeah, and. Um well, why is it that when people make decisions that affect you, they don't listen to your lived experience or people like you? Very often, only expert witnesses are listened to who are people who have a lot of education or the Structure is set up so that even. You may want to stop this for a second. We want to get you to say that again. Sorry. <laughs> in yeah. some in some situation, another reason why lived experience is not listened to is that uh, things are set up in more of a court type fashion, and. Lawyers are only allowed to talk to lawyers, and in my interest, city planners are only allowed to talk to city planners, or not necessarily city planners, but urban and regional planners are only allowed to talk to planners, and, uh, and uh, lawyers are only allowed to talk to lawyers. Uh, and, uh, and, and in a recent decision, 
with the I'm digressing. Let's go on. It's okay. One second. I'm actually going to close this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's totally cool, Martin. You're doing great. I needed a little break anyway to close the door. <laughs> the, 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 to further answer that question, the structure is Many people who have experienced stigma um, are afraid to come out in other forums as well to talk. And often the forums are geared to listen to uh, experts and not people with lived experience. And uh, the lived experience is not seen as, um, as significant as uh, quantitative data. What is it like someone like you could bring to the table? Uh, you're not letting me go through my list of oh, that's, outline that's here. That's totally cool, Myron. Let's go through the list. Okay, I'm someone who sees this video. I am, or I might know someone living with a disability. What would joining this group do for me? What would join this group do for you, or for someone who is looking at this video? That remains to be seen because once again, we are in a period of transition. Uh, when I joined the group, uh, I was in my early 40s, and so I was in midlife. Now I am an adult or adult, and many of the people um, who are seen as the core of the group are also older adults. And at that time, my understanding is when it's when the human rights and disability group, disability and human rights group started, there was concern by some of the older adults about passing on the baton to younger people. And I believe we are in that situation again. So we have provided a very good framework uh, that would be nice if some of that framework could be maintained. But it has always depended on the participation in the members of how and where the group goes. And how would you bring a new member into the group and make them feel welcome? What made you feel welcome? What made me feel welcome in the group? Yeah. Um, I was treated with respect and dignity, and I was, uh, although I always didn't have a chance to get my voice spoken, there always was a time later to get my voice spoken. And, uh, and so uh, uh, one of the things that was important for me was that I wasn't a constant person coming out the first, I didn't come to every single meeting the first while, but I was welcome when I did come out. And so gradually, uh, my commitment built, and I was welcome. And so I was uh, enabled to go at my own pace of my level of commitment to the group and my level of uh, ability to participate. If 
you were to pick one moment as a lasting memory of the group since you've been a member, what would it be? Well, I've picked out four or five. Yeah, right on. <laughs> okay. Well, the constant that was always part of the group since I've been a part of it has been the issue of uh, uh, getting to the group and sidewalks. And uh, the focus has often focused on snow and getting able to get to with snow. But it's also been focusing on uh, sidewalks that are slippery and so the end uh, uh, and being able that has been a constant from the very beginning that I've been participating is getting to the group and the group is strength is based on face to face contact and putting a face with a name uh, and if you can't get to the group it's very difficult to participate and so that has been a constant, but that's not what got me to the group. Uh, there was a I listed four things. I'm sorry, would you be able to move your hand to you not covering up the mic? Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> there are four four memories of the group that I have that uh, why I got excited about participating in the group and I'm continuing to be excited about participating in the group. The first thing that got me excited about the group was a partnership with the University of Winnipeg. And uh, the Social Development Center, at that time called the Social Planning Council of Kitchener Waterloo, uh, there was five or six studies with partnerships with the University of Winnipeg with the Disability Department. And uh, three or four of them were facilitated by the Social Development Center, or Social Planning Council at that time. And I was part of a group, and we were developing an additional planning tool to go along with traditional planning tools. And uh, I was lucky enough to get a plane ride to Winnipeg where we put the final touches on that tool. I'm talking about the University of Winnipeg. And there was a, and I was representing, I represent a group called uh, Navigating Income Supports. And uh, that got me very excited about being part of the group. Uh, the second thing is that, I got support from the group, and I got support from the leader of the social, of the disability and human rights group at that time. Uh, there were several more staff at that time involved. At that time, there was a woman named Nancy. Uh, and uh, she helped me go get courage to go to my MP and MPP to and also to advocate for myself in front of the Ontario Disability Support Tribunal. The third thing, and this was more with Trudy, who was the executive director all the time that I was part of the group, uh, was She nudged me to have a kitchen table talk in my neighborhood, which was at that time identified as my building complex, where I lived with 19 other uh, housing units. And we were a true neighborhood in that we didn't all have a lot of things in common. We were a true neighborhood in that we weren't a homogenous, homogenous group. And 
we got almost everybody out for that neighborhood meeting, that uh, kitchen table talk, and uh, and we got data from that group, and and there was some student interns that also I was looking for that kitchen table talk document, and I do have it, but uh, uh, I was nudged to have, that's I, another stronger word for that is be pushed a little bit, mm -hmm. to, uh, and another word for that is, uh, uh, I believe, I was nudged to empower myself with both of those things. With the one thing I was empowered to go towards the ODSB tribunal, which I lost, by the way. And I was also nudged and empowered to have that kitchen table talk in my neighborhood. And, uh, and, uh, and I did it very, all fully willingly, but I was, Nudge a little bit to do it, and sometimes people need a nudge, to uh, uh, to uh, especially when they've experienced a uh, lot of powerlessness and uh, 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 stigma. The third thing, the fourth thing, and this is more recent is that we put in a proposal for $5,000 and a proposal for $10,000. We're hoping for the proposal for $10,000. And if we couldn't get the grant for $10,000, we're hoping for a grant for $5,000. Um, and that was for internships for people with lived experience. And by that, right now there are a lot of internships available for people who, have, who are in school full-time or full-time students. They can get internships very easily. If you are uh, uh, wanting to become a lawyer, there are internships for becoming a lawyer. But there is not internships for people who have, don't have a university education or who are not in school full-time. And so we put in a proposal for just simply $10,000 and I was able to uh, because of my participation with the Disability and Human Rights Group, I was able to work with the executive director. At this time, Trudy had passed on, and the new executive director was Alexandra. And we worked together to put forward a proposal for the Disability and Human Rights Group to get a grant for $5,000 for internships for people with lived experience. So to get money for people to participate in a group and uh, which is only available right now if you're a full-time student. And I am hopeful that we'll be able to get that in the future. The fifth thing that uh, uh, was very important for the social developments for the human disability human rights group and uh, this was done with both Trudy and Alexandra was that uh, we participated in government podcasts and as a group we responded to uh, government documents and the last one we participated in was the financial committee of our present provincial government. But we did other podcasts with the federal government as well. So those are the five things that are good memories that if the Disability and Human Rights Group would cease to exist, those would be five good memories that I would have of the Disability Human Rights Group. Yeah. We got about 10 minutes left on the test. Okay, awesome. Okay, I, ha I have one last 
thing. Well, yeah, okay. I said, A, the one constant that's been a part of this group has been getting to the group. And face-to-face -face has been a very important part of that. And it has tended to focus on sidewalks and the isolation that comes when you cannot access sidewalks. I listed five things that were good memories for me of this group. And then this group was also a springboard for me onto other involvement. And so at one time, uh, the poverty, Kitchener Waterloo poverty, poverty, how does that group go? Poverty free Kitchener Waterloo had one representative. I was enabled to become the second representative, and then it was opened up to everyone. And then another part was involvement. The social development study was involved with Festival of Neighborhoods and was a, probably a founding member of Festival of Neighborhoods, along with uh, John McDonald Architects. And for participating in Festival of Neighborhoods, people Neighborhood organizations got a grant, and my neighborhood of Cherry Park Neighborhood Association got a grant of staff time to work developing the neighborhood. And out of that, we got one neighborhood meeting. Since then, we've got a 20,000 grant from the Festival of Neighborhoods, which we have to spend in the next year. Uh, so it's been a springboard to other activities, like Neighborhood Association and, uh, and this last October, I ran for mayor of Kitchener, which I would not have had the courage to do at all if I wouldn't have had these accumulative buildup of uh, strengths with the social, with the Disability and Human Rights Group, and yes. Yeah, that was awesome, Larry. Good, all right. Yeah. Yeah. We will